Back again with Richard Tillinghast. And we were talking before the break about your experience in South America, and I want to kind of continue that. So let's just kind of pick up where we left off. Um, your experience there, I mean, your, your full, or I guess I should rephrase that, your intention when you went to South America, was that sort of to experience what you ended up experiencing there, or did that, was that sort of just a byproduct of the trip? I think, yeah, I think it was more of an intention at that okay. point because having traveled some before, I definitely, um, you know, I was interested in the, the culture and the, in the city and whatnot, but I definitely wanted to get out of that as quickly as possible and get, uh, in, and, I, and I say in quotes, the jungle because, you know, that's such a cliche, the jungle, right. but, but, but that's what people call it. And, um, and it's very hard actually to get into the jungle because the roads stop and there's a lot of you know regulations uh, even uh, some form of permits something to get in there but one way or another i figured out that the only way to get anywhere was going to be by boat which is what people have figured out for years and years you know centuries and all so i was traveling with this german and a canadian and myself and it's not a joke no we were, <laughs> we were traveling together and so we uh we started out taking uh boats out of uh i believe it was coco ecuador I may be pronouncing that wrong, but we, we started out taking larger boats, even with motors, and then um, got on, at some point, a, a big ferry boat with, you know, 100 people sleeping in their hammocks shoulder to shoulder, and we just kept going, and I think I went down river a couple of months trying to uh, get as far as possible, and um, <clears throat> ended up in uh, dugout canoes and just keeping on going, basically, and I remember... Uh, somewhere along that road, you know, in in some, uh, I just thought of a uh, one of my experiences was we hit shore somewhere and we're hiking, we're looking for some village, you know, and just hiking through some trail or something. And now, did you have a guide or anything? Or no? With, so you guys were just really just kind of hoping for the best, almost. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and believe me, this is not like in like real National Geographic explorer explorers. You know, they're they're really out there. We're we're just getting off the beaten path some. You know. Okay. And um, uh, we you know, and and this the German guy spoke good Spanish, and so that helped a lot. Um. So anyway, I just remember we were walking. We were looking for some village that somebody told us about, and we come across. Basically, the entire village was out. Uh, building a, a house out on the outskirts. They were all working together, all about 32 of them. And, um, you know, they were in the middle of construction and having done some work myself in America, you know, you come across people working, you're like, okay, I, I can spare 10 minutes to talk to you, but I need to get back to hammering these nails. I need to get it fixed. You know, the whole village, uh, you know, they'd seen uh, travelers before and all, but, you know, the whole village was just very relaxed and, ah, oh, tell us your story. And, have a cup of tea and sit down with us and you know and the men the women the children everybody was there and it just became a community group and we all just talked for two or three hours and they took us down the river and fed us and then we walked back to the village and you know and you're perfect strangers to these people oh yeah yeah they were, they were just and they weren't just delighted to have different people there they were just sort of delighted in general uh-huh and um you know, the, and, and I was, you know, and they left their work laying there on the ground. I'm like, well, it'll get done, you know. What's the hurry? You know, we live out here. We don't, there's no, nothing else to do but just live. And I remember staying in one of the people's uh, houses. It was just a, a raised platform on stilts with a thatched roof and open air all the way around. A little uh, cooking area in one side with a metal, piece of metal down that's cooking on top of it. And they had this uh, rich cocoa brown river out behind the house. So, you know, fish in the river, uh, lots of fruit from the jungle and all. And um, once again, just impacted me as just very peaceful, content people. Um, and I just couldn't help but think, you know, they living day to day, breathing in this nature and just being out there was very peaceful for them, I believe. Mm -hmm. And they don't, you know, they don't have any of the modern conveniences and they don't even really have much material possessions at all and yet they're very they're very content and there's a genuine happiness is what I'm hearing from you is what you experienced right and it leads me to believe that I really think that maybe the less contact we have with uh, things that that we manufacture mechanical things and almost the, the less 
contact with that, maybe the better. I mean, we all feel good when we go through our drawers. I have far too much stuff, you know, I have tons of things, you know, my child has tons of things. But when we go through and we put a whole bunch in a box and we give it away or something, it, it feels good. It's mm -hmm. the purge. I really feel that, and when you're traveling, you're wearing the same pair of pants and the same pair of shoes every day after day. Or when you go to a festival for a week and you just live in that way, that, that that's happiness. I, I think that too many things around you is detrimental to your mental health, really. That's a really interesting way of putting it, and yet it's very um, relatable because you do, when you think about it, I mean, we are so tied to all of our, you know, our, our iPhones and our laptop and, you know, our car and our house and all these things, um, which many of it is really not even necessary, but it controls us to such a great extent. And so to experience that like you did firsthand, what do you think that experience has done for you in respect to your music? Hmm. One thing connected to what you were just saying, I used to love my driving time. It was quiet time, no talking to anybody, especially long distance driving. Um, now, of course, the cell phone's there. Of course, it's illegal now, and I never do it, of course. But uh, uh, of I, course you know, not. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, the cell phone, I just used to love, you know, you get home, you check your messages. But the driving time was great. And I used to write a lot in my head while I was driving and, uh, you know, scribbling on the seat next to me on a notebook, too. But that, that time, uh, that quiet time writing was, a, a, driving can be a meditative process. Um, so how has that impacted the music? Um, <clears throat> definitely um, looking for themes, you know, my, myself connected to nature. We are all, all, our community is connected to nature. Being in the Northwest, I was a stranger to how uh, important salmon are to, salmon are like the lifeblood of the West. I found that when I came out here, I was actually a vegetarian when I first came out. And then oh, really? that didn't last long because you have to eat salmon. If you go to a friend's barbecue, you know, there's fish. That's the goodness of life out here. So, and um, one of the songs I'm going to play has to do a little bit with salmon. Yeah, well, let's there. talk about that a little bit. Um, I think you're going to play us two or three songs. Uh huh. And so what, what are the songs you're going to play? Well, I'm going to play one called I Seem to Be Lost. Okay. And that one was... Uh, it was inspired. I was at the Wind River Hot Springs near Carson, um, a great spot, and uh, just looking at the salmon going back upstream. And there's a high suspension bridge uh, that you can cross to get to the hot springs, and it's actually off limits now. It's actually technically you're trespassing if you're on it. Oh, okay. And you know that's and it's funny. It's kind of uh, indicative of 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 uh, the, the civilized world. You know, I, I, was, I spent some time many years ago looking down off that bridge and just seeing the salmon and everything, and now you're not even supposed to go on the bridge. So one song is called I Seem to Be Lost, and it's about being on the hot springs, looking at the salmon, picturing the salmon swimming back upstream, something to do with that. Mm -hmm. And another song I'm gonna play is um, it's kind of an old one, but it has to do with this neat old banjo that is here. This is a 1924 Gibson banjo. Okay. And um, I have a really dear friend named Doug McCoy who lives up in Trout Lake. And I was up visiting him in his little cabin out in the woods and uh, saw this case lying in the, uh, in the, in the uh, loft of the, and I opened it up and this, this old banjo was in there. And this part, the head was broken. The strings were, there weren't any, there was maybe a couple strings. The tune, everything was pretty much broken. But I realized it's a really neat instrument. It's hefty. You know, it's solid. Is there no back on it either? No, it's just uh, oh, okay. I have a microphone taped in it for uh -huh. a performance, actually. Sure. But yeah, that's it. That's that's the way. It looks like a tambourine. <laughs> it, it, it is. It's kind of like a, it's very similar to tambourine. Tambourines okay. have a head like that. And uh, yeah, you put the jingle bells around it, and it's a tambourine. I mean, wow. I should do that. I should tie jingle bells all around it. There you it. go. Maybe. Huh? Wonder. Might be an interesting sound. Yeah. But, um, but anyway, so Doug... Um, Doug is a great guy, and he said, Doug, Richard, you should just hang on to that banjo for a while. And um, so I took it to my friend Craig uh, Luthier in White Salmon, and he fixed it all up, and, and then I started playing it. As a matter of fact, from the, the second that I picked it up, this one, this one riff, it's kind of out of tune, I tuned up, but kind of was going through it in my head over and over with the banjo. 
And I think that's kind of the reason that I ended up with a banjo to write this one particular song. All right. And that's the one you're going to play I'm going to play it today. Yeah. Great. Mm -hmm. Well, good. Well, I'm going to go ahead. We're going to go to break here real quick, and then I'm going to get out of the way, let you do your thing. So thanks, so thanks, thanks for coming in. Thanks really appreciate it. Me. Thanks for sharing your perception or your perspective on, on life and nature and, um, and now your music. So we'll look forward to hearing that when we come back. You guys, uh, Richard Tillinghast will uh, play some songs when we come back. So stick with us. Be right back.